Greetings, everyone. This is Ayman Tarabishi, um, ICSB President and CEO, and also Deputy Chair of the Department of Management at uh, GW. I am delighted to have you again for the ICSB Exchange webinars. I hope you are doing all well and safe. It, it, is, August, it is almost August here, so it, it's in the middle of the summer here in Washington, D.C., but it might be winter somewhere else. Um, let us start. I am excited with this new session or this new exchange webinar here. And the title of it is Digital Futures, Intelligence and Capital, the Changing Systems and Capabilities for Entrepreneurs in the Digital Era. And it's a, it's a, it's a long title, but it's an exciting title. I believe it. Just the concept, the word itself, digital futures, got me very excited when I saw it together because in a way we are living in the future right now. The ICSB exchange webinars that we started back in March was, was, was kind of br bringing the future to ICSB. And now we're doing all these exchange webinars. So we're, we're really excited to do this. More, I'm more excited also to introduce the main speaker, the lecturer for this, um, Dr. Nasu Diabou Tara, Senior Lecturer in Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Bournemouth University in the UK. Uh, Dr. Nasu is, research and, is a research and professional expertise covers aspects of entrepreneurship, innovation, and design management, starting and scaling digital businesses, digital clustering, and innovation ecosystems. He has examined and is now supervising doctoral students in the fields of entrepreneurship and innovation management with focus on digital entrepreneurship, clustering, and ecosystem. He has written papers on digital cluster innovation in, and in, in the Bournemouth and Poole region of the UK, Africa, as well as, as led the publications of an eclectic pioneering book on digital entrepreneurship in Sub-Saharan Africa. And his, his bio is just incredible. I talked to him on a Zoom call about 10 days ago or two weeks ago, and I took the Zoom call while I was driving and he was there and we connected very fast and I, and I gave him a mandate. I told him, I would love to hear about your talk, but I also challenged him and told him, give us what you really think, not what other people think, but what you really think. And he took on this challenge. He worked extremely hard. So uh, without, without any more hesitation here, Dr. Nasr, we are just, ICSB just delighted to have you here. We're delighted to hear about you here. And we wish you the best in creating a new conversation that we are looking forward to. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Ayman. Um, and thank you very much to ICSB leadership for the opportunity. And I like the way you put it, um, creating a new conversation. And you wanted me to actually talk about uh, what I think. And also, I would like to use the opportunity um, to extend greetings to all the listeners out there, wherever you may be around the world, but also for the opportunity to listen to me, uh, to talk to you about uh, something that I consider to be very close uh, to my heart, very close to my chest, so much so that I feel it's somewhat, um, it has become personal. And this is the issue of intelligence and within the context of digital futures and capital. And I think, I guess what I'm going to try to do is to kind of um, synthesize between these three really exciting uh, areas and, and try to do that within um, my journey uh, in life. So I say that the topic is very um, close to my heart because I'm going to start by sharing uh, a story with you. And this story um, throughout my career and my life, I never shared with anyone. And so um, please listen attentively to the story uh, because I think um, there is a lot of learning and it forms the bedrock or foundation of, you know, the formative years that founded my intelligence as such. So when I was growing up as a kid, I had a very good upbringing. Um, our dad made sure that you know, we never had to struggle financially and, um, you know, while studying and all that. And in that regard, um, I'm, I'm ever grateful um, for, for that opportunity. And in that regard, I, I, I found myself really like, however, there was something that happened. Um, when I was studying and everyone that knows me tend to say that I, I tend to work um, slightly harder than, than usual or normal, but there was a reason. 
uh, the main reason was that I think, um, call it what you may, uh, this has different semantic names people call it, but I think I was a slow reader. Others would call it slow learners and others would call it sort of slow um, cognition, your ability to process the information quickly. And I think because the educational system was organized and designed, you know, uh, being shaped strongly by the Industrial Revolution, we find ourselves uh, in, in this very past-faced environment where everything needs to happen too quickly and that um, it must instance this intelligence in the context of educational system or outside is mainly aligned to, to cognitive speed, you know, the, the quicker you speed, uh, the better. So I struggled in a way and I think um, not that my performances were that bad, but something that would take someone probably a day to do might take me three days or more to do that. And I think that somewhat evoked some kind of um, negative emotion in me. And so, but I was lucky again, um, something happened. Uh, but before I say that, I also want to add to the fact that in addition to the slow learning that I had, I also had a little bit of um, uh, selective memory that is a bit poor sometimes, you know, it selects what it needs to be poor on. Um, I remember an instance where I went out with a friend of mine, the closest, um, one of my closest friend, Abu Bakr, and on coming back, I totally forgot that I went out with him. And I only remembered when I almost um, get home. And then when I turned to go back and then there he was, and he said, you know, don't explain. And I understand. So, you know, these are the two things that I think somewhat constantly I was thinking to myself, is it because I was less intelligent compared to others? So I had to constantly work hard. So while I was struggling to deal with this negative emotion, something happened. I met a friend who introduced me to, to, to birds and I become so interested in birds like pigeons and many other collections of African birds. And I had this collection of birds um, in, in my family home that I always engaged with. And that becomes for me what normally is called like space within a space, uh, which normally uh, the philosophers of time and space termed as heterotopia. Uh, so when I disconnect and then connect with my bird's nest, in there I found you know, an opportunity to use that space as a therapeutic space, if you like, to release that negative emotions. It also become a contemplative space for me where I imagine, um, I think about, um, you, you know, the world, I, I think about uh, universe and mankind generally. I also, it gave me an opportunity to become more compassionate in the sense that I was closer to, to animals and I understood the relationship between us and them, I become more compassionate. And in essence, in summary, I was just going to say that this gives me an opportunity to start building or nurturing skills on developing the emotional intelligence as such. So, but today I now ask the question, I reflect back and I say to myself, what if I haven't had that opportunity in my life to have, you know, found the, uh, the, the, the bird's nest to, to be an escape route for me to, to kind of deal with this? And a bigger question would be, how many more people would be out there now who we're trying to train as entrepreneurs who are dealing with this kind of um, situation? So, and this is why I would like to discuss within this angle how the shaping the early formative years are crucially uh, important. So, so now decades after, I find myself in, in an uh, exciting university, which is called the Bournemouth University, southwest of England. And um, Bournemouth University, we are very good at digital and impact digital futures. Perhaps I not have had the name Bournemouth University, but you would probably have experienced Bournemouth University through some of the great work that some of our students are doing. Like over 50 BU graduates, um, you know, were involved in, in the work of Oscar winning uh, film, uh, The Gravity. And this wasn't just it. There were so many um, movies 
uh, that many blockbusters. So, and in this university also, you know, it's a home to National Center for Computer Animation. We do things like, um, and we're now launching a course on MSc Artificial Intelligence. So the reason why this is relevant to this is no coincidence, you know, having had you, you know, that struggles um, of childhood, you know, of the speed versus the, the, the slow uh, nature of my learning. Um, but I now see that what happens now, we're talking about computer animation and games. Our university is one of the best you could find in this. And now you have games with this immersive experiences. And I know very well that going into the digital futures, when we have kids, when they ex um, find a, um, um, a space to escape is either playing video games, animations, and, and, and things like that. So, but I do say that when you approach this as just a tool for entertainment, rather than also providing um, an opportunity for them to actually learn certain uh, intelligence skill set that they can actually bring back to, to the world uh, as we know it, the human world, then I think uh, there is a lot that needs to be done. Now we're talking about um, VR, you know, AR, you know, providing all these immersive experiences, but in most instances what you see are the, um, you know, the entertainment aspect of it. So therefore, going forward, you know, what I do is everything that had happened to me, everything that I learned in, in my bird's nest, you know, as it form an integral part of my intelligence, I continue to continue to use this, you know, in my research, my education, and also professional practice. I would show you a game which I led uh, the development of at Bournemouth University, um, which tries to, to help entrepreneurs to be more resilient, to be more able to manage and regulate their emotions and therefore more emotionally intelligent. And that, you know, summarizes uh, some of the things I do. So as Ayman says, I'm just talking about this mainly from what I think perspective, but also backed by some of the research I've conducted. Um, so here I just give some, uh, you know, selection of some few of my publications, one in Journal of Small Business Management, and then um, the, the Palgrave book we published, and then also um, there was um, some other media outlets. And, and by the way, the Journal of Small Business Management is, is, is a journal sponsored by the ICSB, so it's great to see. So I just picked on that. I'm just going to talk about something really exciting that I think is important in the context of uh, intelligence, but also uh, within the context of the digital futures. So I noticed while in Bournemouth that something unusual is happening, that instead of entrepreneurs moving from the periphery to the center, the opposite is beginning to happen. Uh, so much so that you'd find people who used to live in London, but now moving to, to Bournemouth for a reason. And, you know, why not? Because what the statistics uh, is showing, because of this fast-faced environment that was created, which I talked about, I think there's a lot of pressure on entrepreneurs and especially the digital entrepreneurs to quickly, you know, deliver. But now with the rise of digital connectedness, the fact that you can do, you know, transact your businesses everywhere, um, you know, and be able to live everywhere, this is fueling this kind of trend of what is called the peripheral entrepreneurship. Before, you always see things in the center, but now we are seeing them in, in the periphery. Now, this is important because in, in the wake of work-life balance, we're going to see going forward in the digital futures a lot more of this. This is because um, of rec a recent um, report I was reading, you know, um, from we are 60, um, organization, uh, the report shows that uh, nine of 10 entrepreneurs that they surveyed here in the UK uh, tend to show sign of mental strain, sort of, and also about 78% pounders tend to struggle with some mental health issues. So now what is happening is that with the rise of um, regions like Bournemouth, which are seaside towns that provide the opportunity for slow entrepreneurship, if you like, peripheral entrepreneurship, work-life balance, and then the gig economy all coming together. People are feeling, you know, 
why do I have to live in London, for example? Why can't I move and, and enjoy life by the beach while also doing my businesses? So it was on the basis of that that we actually published this paper, we conducted this research, and also not only did we find um, this uh, trend interesting, but also that the businesses, the critical mass of digital enterprises in Bournemouth area happens to, you know, be the frequently innovative uh, businesses as well. So there is more to this, but I think um, I'm just going to go move on, on to the next. And so here is, is, you know, a very important thing I really want to talk about. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, you know, you know, the explosion of, you know, the semantics and, and the application is, you know, beyond comprehension, so to speak. But when I looked at, when I read or looked at artificial intelligence, you know, I see three things. I see um, opportunities, I see threats, and I also see peers. Now, what tend to happen um, is that, you know, the, and, and this is a fact, what, what the fact is showing is that uh, literally the machines are now squaring us in terms of the intelligence. And I think what's happening is because we were trying to compete with them on a space that probably we couldn't, which is about the speed, the cognition, the processing. And we were doing less more in terms of investing in uh, educating entrepreneurs on emotional intelligence, cultural intelligence, and social intelligence. So, you know, of course, I understand the peers because we're talking about the readiness in terms of uh, going forward into the digital future, going to hospital and um, be seen by, uh, you know, a robot doctor or going to, a, um, you know, bank to discuss sensitive financial issues with, with, with robots or perhaps maybe 85 percent has been predicted in terms of the retail um, customer face roles to potentially be replaced you know so i see that but also there are great opportunities that are happening you know within you know the application of artificial intelligence and while there are so many globally there are some few that caught my attention in africa um, there is a farm um, that is that is called the um, a uh, plant clinic that is, you know, investing in, in integrated artificial intelligence in a way that they can diagnose plants. And in collaboration with a lab laboratory in the United States, they imported, I think, about 60,000 imageries. And as a result, they created an algorithm that predicts, um, you know, the the diagnosis that, that, that they offer. And also there was another one application of the artificial intelligence, which I really liked. Um, it was a firm in um, Kenya, it's, it was called Komazo, where they also integrated artificial intelligence to help them monitor um, plant growth, uh, trees growth rather, um, and helping them with sustainable forestry. Going forward, they're thinking or planning to you know, build, uh, to, to, to plant as much as 1 billion trees. At the moment, they've planted like 6 million or thereabout. So I think it is important to see that, you know, we have to reconcile all of this, you know, but, but the final one, which then becomes the threat, because I talk about, um, the, you know, the opportunities, the threat, you know, comes also when in the midst of this opportunity, you know, there is a prediction um, that has been made, and this is was reported in African uh, trade report uh, last year, that the cost of robots in the United States by 2033, I think, would be less than the chief labor, formal labor in Kenya, for example, and which therefore meant that instead of offshoring, um, then it would be the, 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 the opposite, you, you know, farms are going to start, um, you know, calling back, because if it is cheaper to manufacture it elsewhere, why then do you have to um, do it elsewhere? So these are some exciting times. A lot of things are happening, but I do think somewhat because of the nature in which we organized our environment and the entrepreneurial setting, we are doing less in terms of the other forms of intelligence. So there are so many definitions of intelligence, but I actually liked this one, even though it was referred 
in mass literature as non-intelligent uh, account of, in, um, sorry, non-expert account, but I, I really like it. Um, you know, this is intelligence according to the Kenyans. I'm not a native Kenyan speaker, but uh, it's called RICO. Um, that is intelligence comprises of RICO, knowledge and skills, plural respect, winter comprehension, and real life and power uh, initiative. So, and I really liked it because, you know, given the nature of where we find ourselves today, you know, of what benefit is intelligence that we pride ourselves as humans with if we don't respect our fellow humans? Of what benefit intelligence is if we don't respect our environment of what benefit you know is intelligence if really we don't respect you know all the things within the ecosystem that that that, that is important to us and and, and 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 the future as well and the last one um paro initiative i remember my dad constantly challenging us and saying that um have you used your initiative do you not want to use your initiative? So I think there is certain kind of commonality in terms of the definition of what intelligence is in Africa, which is why I really liked uh, this. So, you know, everything now consolidated for me. And then when I began teaching entrepreneurship uh, in the UK, the formative years of my life where I gathered that intelligence is multidimensional, I learned emotional intelligence in the bird's nest and, and, and beyond, I tried to you know, I built this framework. Um, I'm going to be very brief in explaining this. I call it the five zone framework simply because I do not like the approach of, um, you know, bunching everyone together and assuming that their own learning needs are the same when you teach entrepreneurship. So what I do, what I do with this is that I have, the first thing I try to understand is the zone of intelligence. You know, what, what is your emotional intelligence? what cultural intelligence do you have, what practical, what social, and that guides, um, you know, how I structure and support you through the learning. Because, you know, we all know that, for example, business plans are great tools for motivating the students, for also uh, raising funds and all that, everyone has business plan. But actually, if a student registered for an entrepreneurship course or to learn digital entrepreneurship or whatever, but with the sole purpose of nurturing and developing more of their um, emotional intelligence, but then they ended up writing a business plan only, I think the purpose might be somewhat limited. So I use, use this as, as a yardstick. So another thing I wanted to uh, bring to the discussion also, which also I think is an alternative view, but this is a put for thought. So you, you are free to disagree, but you know, I think somehow I feel us humans tend to have somewhat uh, an exaggerated uh, view of our own intelligence because, you know, paradoxically, I think what's supposed to happen is that collectively we're supposed to be more intelligent than individually. But, you know, when I look at things like when, for example, COVID-19 struck and that our collective response, I, I, don't th I think it should have been more. Or, for example, I look at things like our efforts, global efforts in, in, you know, fighting or making sure that the environment, you know, stays, you know, in the right place that it needs to be after we messed off our environment and all the disagreements between the global leaders. Then I feel like I think individually, probably we're intelligent, but collectively we are less so. But this is a food for thought. And I think this is some, because if you think about it, when an enemy strikes like the COVID does, and the more of collective intelligence we have, then the more we are able to do with it together. But if we all have different disagreements and, and, and w w what you, whatever that is, then you know, the chances are that the enemy you know, overrun the system. So this is something uh, to think about. Now, I also wanted to talk about uh, the, the fact that, you know, digital entrepreneurship is global, but, you know, something is happening, especially in Africa. And I really wanted to emphasize this because Africa missed out um, in, in most of prior revolutions, like uh, first, second, third industrial revolution, but with 4.0 fourth industrial revolution, I think something dramatic is happening. Um, there are real mature 
real mature um, technologies, for example, the drones, the robotics, uh, and all such kind of advanced, um, you know, tools and devices that are now being applied um, in Africa. And this had to happen because I think in most developing, con in most developed countries, uh, due to ethical debates, this is still ongoing, and that they have had to find another you know, opportunity to kind of apply this. And for example, in Rwanda, when they started using the drones to, to airlift uh, health and medical supplies for humanitarian logistics, that was a real game changer. So Africa, I think now is one of the gold mines we're talking about. I also, in addition to research and teaching and, and, and professional practice, I, I like to engage practically with businesses. And so therefore I bring together, um, given what I said earlier, I bring together this uh, platform, I co-founded it. And what we do is we kind of, you know, naturally kind of sensitize this curiosity are around tech for social good, application of technology for social good. And then we mentor, we provide challenges for many farms and we connect them uh, from Africa and other parts of the world. And so this is what we do in this platform. Um, this are so many examples of tech for social good. Uh, think about health tech, FinTech, EdTech, sharing economy, there are so many um, going forward. But also, like I mentioned earlier, you know, because of the influence I had from the early formative years, I constantly, whenever I engage with technology, I try to see it from the point of view of the collective, from the point of view of who has been marginalized, which was why, um, you know, I led the team that, you know, developed this um, simulation game that helps entrepreneurs who fail to deal with failure and learn from failure. And this book I wrote for myself sometimes in 2013. And the idea is about, you know, in order to be happy, to slow down, you need a perfect balance of knowledge, wealth, and wisdom. But the later people told me it's interesting. And then I, you know, develop it into an app, uh, which was downloadable. And I find that uh, youth tend to, you know, um, download it more simply because it is important to initiate the conversation what is more important is it knowledge wealth wisdom at a point in life or if they're equally important which one do you first acquire and then move on to 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 the next so conscious of time i'm still going forward um this is very very important uh talking about the capital i try as much as i can to summarize um this very difficult um Topic, but all I'm trying to demonstrate or illustrate here is that the evolution of capital in time. From the time when capital is immobile, we're talking about land, labor, for example, the time when, when people really need to raise capital, they must travel to uh, Silicon Valley, for example, and then capital becomes less tangible, human, intellectual, and that. But now I think we are in another stage where I call the next intangibility uh, of capital. So, you know, shaped by all this movement, slow movement that I'm talking about, tech for social good, um, social network. Now, when you want to set up your business, you need um, little less than just the content and, and maybe your laptop and, and probably when you have a great content and, and that's it. So I think going into the digital futures, what we're going to see, there are some certain very uh, interesting things. For example, um, a term I coined um, ubiquitous capital, meaning that you could be anywhere, but because of the digital advances and the reaching out to, for example, someone in a remote, um, place in, in Nigeria, Hotoro, or, or in Nigeria, Ede, or, you know, in Jigawa, or, or anywhere, you, you know, around, around the world. So, you know, we have to be cautious of that. But also, very importantly, the trust capital. So, you know, now we are talking about integrating artificial intelligence to, to policing, um, to, 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 uh, to, to policing, generally policing software. Now, there had been argument and there has been skepticism. Others who felt like historically, the data, uh, you know, suggests that they have been um, kind of, um, we're not in a good place when that happened historically, that to be 
able to use the same data and integrate into artificial intelligence would mean that we are going to be creating um, artificial intelligence that are biased as well. So it is important while moving into the digital future and while this is all important, it's going to help us to police the future well, it is important that we go back and paste this uncomfortable truth and discuss with the people who felt like the data was suggesting um, that it was biased before we actually move forward. Otherwise, we are moving into the digital future, um, you know, integrating the artificial intelligence into the policing and patient recognition software only to be back at, you know, uh, the same place. Okay. Something also interesting happening, patient capital, you know, I'm always, all the, what I'm saying is kind of alternate views. So I don't want this, you know, past faced environment, which is why I'm an advocate of the slow patient and all that. So uh, thankfully, now, uh, you know, we are having to see more and more uh, investors and governments investing in capital that is called patient capital, because traditionally when you have investors invested in you, they will be on your neck, they're constantly pushing you, and, and that doesn't help, I think, with, with the mental health and all that. So it's important, I think, going into the future that we also see more of this, but it is good that at least we're seeing uh, some of this now. So I want to conclude my topic or my discussion here with what I called the cycle of good. And the cycle of good simply means like the application of technology either now or in the future should always take into consideration the goodness uh, it provides against anything else, against anything. So it could be artificial intelligence or it could be you're a social media influencer or you just apply technology or it's a game or inclusive. There must be uh, a social good element for it. And I think it is possible but it is not possible if we continue to attempt to do it individually. So what I suggest going forward is that why not, I'm, and I'm talking to you, the listener right now, and I believe in you and I believe each and every one of us has got something to offer to the future. Take any of these technologies, for example, that you're comfortable with, try and see how you can apply it within the context of solving um, a global problem um, you, you know, within the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, either to reduce poverty, to reduce, reduce hunger, good health, um, you know, inequality, whatever, gender equality, whatever, you know, means something so close to you. Why not do that? And I'm looking forward to seeing you coming up with innovative solutions uh, within the context of digital futures. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. This has been absolutely exceptional here. You touch on many different topics here, and every time I write something and I circle it, uh, you, write, you say something else, then I have to do a bigger circle, and then I have to do a bigger circle. So now I have a piece of paper with all these big circles here. But let's... Big let's, circles. let's thank you. I must say. No, uh, we have a problem here because we have too many circles here, so we have to go through them. <laughs> we, yes. we have to go through them circle by circle. First of all, okay. I'm just... I'm, I'm very thankful and, and you're, you're very kind uh, talking from a personal standpoint and sharing what you shared earlier from the beginning is very personal, but it also helps kind of make us understand that we're all human and we all approach things from a different perspective here. And some might be faster than others. Some might get it quicker than others, but you've accomplished a lot and you're a leading thinker here. So, so it's just, it, it shows that the world needs to move in many different ways. But we all have to move forward. That's the, uh, that's the objective here. I, I want to ask, and then we'll open up with questions here. Um, okay. This concept of intelligence, okay? I know you rushed yes. it, and this is just the start here. But I want you to take us back a little bit here in your own, in your own word, your own definition here. How do you define human intelligence here? This is, this is something... Uh, this is philosophical, it's historical, it's scientific, but how do you define intelligence in your own words so people can capture? And, I, and then we'll get into some of your graphs here, but let's start with that. Go ahead. Okay, well, um, I, I think the, any notion of intelligence that, you know, will not include the fact that it is multidimensional is more likely not to be acceptable. 
um, you know, from the point of view uh, that I think, but I think of, um, you know, intelligence as the ability to grasp and also make sense of the world, taking into consideration emotional, cultural, and social aspects of life generally. That is, you know, what I think intelligence is. So, you know, the ability to grasp and make sense of your environment, because if you can't make sense of your environment, and which is why here I have uh, the components of what I think makes of intelligent from my own uh, point of view, uh, things like observational intelligence, territorial intelligence, and adaptive intelligence. I, I would tell you that when I arrived in the UK, for example, uh, more than anything else, more than the academic intelligence that, you know, brought me here, the thing that enables me to integrate well into the British society is the adaptive intelligence, situational intelligence, and also observational intelligence. Knowing fully well that when you arrived in any culture that you don't know much about, your ability to stand back and observe and understand all the nuances, because there are certain things that are taken for granted in the culture that nobody talks about, but you don't want to make that mistake. So you have to really stand. And I think I also pounded this, like I said, from, from my bird's nest, because at a point when I had those birds, I would enter into the room and I would spend hours to the point that my mom started to worry, what is he doing there? But what happens was that when I stand in there, it gives me this ability to observe things. And this is something that I developed over the years. And then it becomes, I become, I master this, so to speak. I, I like to stand and observe and make connections. And I think that was all where it started. So I think it's the ability to make sense of the world around you, but also, you know, it's multidimensional and it takes into consideration things like adaptability. That's the adaptive intelligence, the observational and situational intelligence as well. Good. So let me, um, let me, there's a bunch of questions from Professor Mahdi here. So let me start with question number one. Um, right, he talked about, can you shed some light on the reverse migratory patterns of entrepreneurs from the center to the periphery? Um, and he's, yes. he, uh, by the way, he's asking a lot of difficult questions here. So just to let okay. you know, I'm warning you. But he also published a book, so it's very interesting. So the, what do you think of this? Yeah, I, I think, like I said, this is something I really, really, um, I, I was surprised um, initially when I began to notice that because I know some people that actually moved from the center to, to the periphery. And this is interesting because I think what, what is going to happen going forward is, you know, for governments to develop resilience it is important that they continue to invest in the periphery, that is in the regions and making them more intelligent, more smarter uh, to encourage this pattern. Because I think in my opinion, going forward, we're going to see devolution of powers, more or less powers um, in the center and more um, to, to the regions. But like I said, you know, people are really struggling with work-life balance and it is enough to deal with all the things you're dealing with, but also to be in a very past-faced environment. And now the technology is now bringing us this unprecedented opportunity and we have to grab it, you know, be a Bournemouth. I mean, initially we used to have the seaside towns in 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 United Kingdom. Some of them they uh, were reliant on only um, um, tourism as a source of kind of income. But this is changing. For example, I can tell you in Bournemouth or Dorset region, uh, although there is you know the income coming from. Uh, from from the tourism sector, but because of the digital cluster, there is a report by Tech Nation report in 2015, which suggested that Bournemouth was one of the fastest growing digital hubs uh, in the whole of England, and they identified 22 digital hubs in the England. So therefore, it is not just reliant on the tourism, and we are talking about the issue, for example, now with COVID, and people traveling less, but because the, there was a critical mass of this digital clustering happening around. And also, by the way, uh, our university contributed to that because we graduated in digital uh, students and the reason kind of retaining them. So I, I think this is amazing, but also 
the entrepreneurs are moving, but there needs to be a lot more um, incentives to incentivize the, the process so that this could continue because I think it would be a great thing to, to continue yeah. to happen for resilience, yes. I, I agree with you and I support you because believe it or not, and I can support you with this, not just in Bournemouth here, but yeah. um, two years ago, um, we, um, we ICSB started to work with a city outside, outside Seoul, Guangzhou. Mm. Okay. okay. Yeah. And Guangzhou you, um, is, is known historically and known for many things here, but it has two universities there, right? Yeah. And it's about a three hour drive yeah. from Seoul, a three hour train ride from Seoul, um, yeah. high speed train and even less, right? Yeah. And Guangzhou used to be a, a hub for uh, car manufacturing. Hyundai was there and so on. But now they're, they're, they're changing, they're, 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 the dynamics are changing here. Uh -huh. And the city itself, the officials itself were panicking because one of their yeah. major manufacturing was shutting down. Yes. The city has a huge history. Yeah. And, and the president of Korea is actually his mother is from there. So yeah. there's some inclination of emotional attachment to this. The yeah. city was the hub of the revolution yeah. that started yeah. the revolution. So uh -huh. it had significance. Yes. And they were working with ICSB and, and hosting a World Congress. Hmm. Okay? Yeah. And, and, and the, the discussion that we were having saying, this is great. This is a great yeah. historical city, yeah. but you're competing with Seoul. Mm, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> That's right? so true. And, yeah. and think, think, I, 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 I want to relate this to Bournemouth competing with London. Yes, exactly. Right? Actually, we, you know, saying that actually in the report, what they found was that actually uh, the digital hub in, in, in Dorset was growing faster than London then. That was in 2015. Yes. In terms of the but, number of farms, digital but farms the, set up. <laughs> but do you see then, the question is, but then if we, if we, we did some more research, but what we started to see is we started seeing a trend of young entrepreneurs, young people, leaving Seoul, hmm. going to live in Guangzhou, quality of life, because there's a beautiful quality of life there, hmm. and safety, less traffic, cost yeah. of living is less, okay? Yeah. So I'm just going to give you that example. Yeah. And I can just equate it to what's going on in the UK now with, yeah. with, the, with the, I think you're calling it the new deal, in which you're investing, I don't know how many mm -hmm. billions of dollars to, for creating high-speed yeah. trains and yeah. so on to go to the outside of London, yeah. right? So yeah. do you see then the future? And even today, I was reading the paper this morning. Yeah. And, and because some companies now are mandating people to work uh, remotely. Somebody yeah. just, and, and it was a headline article, somebody bought a, a house on a lake saying, well, now <laughs> because I work remotely 100%, why do yeah. I have to be in the city? I really want to buy yeah. my dream house on a lake. I would uh, agree with him. <laughs> so is this the future? If you, do you think now we're moving away from the cities to the periphery? And or it's going to be a balance between both. And why not both, to be honest with you? Yeah, why not both? I, I totally agree with you. I, I don't see the center completely, um, you know, being, you know, um, you, you know, if you like, destroyed or, or disintegrated, so to speak. But it's a devolution of power. Historically, it had always been uh, every country you go to, there is a central kind of city that is overpopulated and is congested. Everyone is there, limited opportunities, the quality of life, um, the quality of air, n n nothing really good. So, so I think it is good to, to have this balance. I don't know what the ratio or the proportion would be depending on the nature of the country. Um, but, you know, something in the region of um, even 60, 40 might be okay. But for now, I think really, because yeah, that, that's what I would, I would think. But I think in the future we are going to, because I mean, why do people go to, to, to the center in such job opportunities and all that? If you can find it, where you would also live better, yep. why not? So let me talk to you about, because recently on Saturday, we talked, we sent an article, and I think this ties to another question here, the nature of knowledge, mm. okay? And I, wanna, and I wanna bring you back to this concept of knowledge. Knowledge now is, it can be shared in many different forms here, but there's a difference between yeah. information, data, yeah. and knowledge, okay? Yeah. Based on your, on your book, based on your research here, what is the new nature of knowledge? I know it's a difficult question, but you're, you're the... Okay. It, it, 
<laughs> it's a difficult question. You're absolutely right. But I think uh, what I would say uh, is, you know, I, I talked about um, the ubiquitous nature or ubiquitous capital, so to speak, which means that you will be anywhere in the world and hence be everywhere, so to speak. I don't know if I said this really correctly, but that is what ubiquitous means. So I think the nature of knowledge is more likely going to be in that form. Let me uh, make this a little bit clearer. For example, I think uh, prior to this technological advances, we all would agree that, you know, um, you know, when we're dealing with emotional contagion, it is more within a scale of pure number of people, for example, okay? So, but now with the explosion of social media, for example, hundreds and millions, you know, uh, thousands. So when someone posted something that is emotionally driven, and especially if that person is um, a social media influencer, he or she is somewhat transmitting um, that negative emotions from around the world. And because the nature of knowledge, like you said, is quite very difficult to, to, to really measure or something, but I think some form of emotionality is somewhat integrated into the form of knowledge that we're talking about here, but that that emotional contagion is something that I had constantly been thinking about in terms of the, the, the knowledge personally, because if you think about, let's talk about someone, um, or if you watch a documentary about, say, for example, um, climate change, and you can't help but being so very emotional, but this is a knowledge, it is real, it's fact. You know, the, the, the world is really undergoing dramatic shifts and as a result of either our actions or our inactions. If you watch the documentary about the, uh, the plastics in, in the oceans, for example, this is knowledge, you know, but the, a lot of people would go back home and find it difficult to sleep, you know, when, when you see a whale uh, eating uh, plastics and they died and, and all that, you know, so this is what I think about the, the, the future of the knowledge in this context. Good. Let me, on the topic of knowledge here, and this is yes. something that I, I found fascinating here, um, okay. because, um, I, again, as, as president and CEO, one of the things that ICSB was, was, um, was limited in, and something that uh, our past, uh, our current chair and our yeah. board said that we need to reach out more to Africa. Okay? We, we, we have presence around the world but Africa was always limited for us because we didn't know people, we didn't know how to interact. There was a lot of things yes. there. But since we launched the ICSB exchange yes. webinars and since yeah. we went digital here, we, we, we have seen a remarkable um, connection to different parts of Africa, from Mali to Kenya mm. to South Africa. Mm. And, 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 and even these discussions that we're having here, and, and, I, and I, I am in awe to be honest with you, I am very happy and I'm excited with all the things that we're doing, even with the International Labor Organization here, yeah. which leads me to the rise of Africa digitally, yeah. mm. okay? And because it's remarkable, the, the, the middle class is rising very rapidly, yeah. the youth are rising, and we had a web, nice webinar with Nigeria about Fantastic. a month and a half ago, right? What, how do you see the role of Africa in knowledge co-creation? Wow. And wow. the youth and, and, is, and, and the network. How do you see this? Uh, I mean, this is a beautiful question, which believe me, I could go another hour <laughs> talking about. <laughs> but I, I'm going to try as much. Uh, maybe we could do another webinar on that, but maybe I'll try as much as possible to, to summarize this. So Africa has a crucial role to play um, in terms of going forward um, d digitally. And... What that means is that historically, Africa tend to be a passive recipient of most developments. But now, with the digital consumption, the digital advances, it is really different. And I said this in some other spaces, and I'm saying it again now, that what is going to happen, what's going forward is going to happen is that we're going to see more and more of African digital farms or Africa as a whole taking um, 
more active rather than passive role in knowledge co-creation and co-production. And what I do mean by that is, for example, imagine, for example, in Rwanda, where I think they, they were among the first countries in the world to have launched the application of the drones um, in the humanitarian logis logistics and supply chain. So what that meant is that although the technology is um, kind of international, developed in other countries, but because of ethical kind of issues, um, it's not, most of the application of it was not in the humanitarian kind of aspect of it. It was used for wars, warfare and other things. So the kind of leadership that Africa will take on here, uh, the co-created leadership, is that, for example, we are talking about completely uncharted terrain about the legislation and airspace laws. Um, you know, health and safety laws with regard to the drone and health, medical, um, humanitarian logistics. And also we are talking about not only just drones, but uh, robotics, um, technology, flying robotics, that would fly into a disaster area, for example, and be able to be emotionally connect with a traumatic person on the ground. So. What, what, this, these are all completely uncharted terrains. And therefore, if these are first happening in Africa, then Africa has the opportunity to not to be passive in this regard, to be active and be the pioneers, for example, in um, legislative innovations, you know, uh, on emotional intelligence and, and the use of uh, robotics, you know, in disaster you know, and, and things like that. So this is uh, one thing. And also, I think it's very important to realize that Africa also missed in most of the other revolutions, but now they have this mobile first mindset. Um, I read a report from the World Bank that suggested that because um, it will take Africa to invest 38 um, million or billion dollars to yearly in order to catch up with the uh, investment in infrastructure, the Africa, and also the same amount for maintenance yearly, the Africa would have no option than to jump and, and be digital and somewhat then continue to, to develop the, 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 the physical infrastructure. Because if the in physical infrastructure is, is very slow to develop and it's very costly, and, but the digital is, is a lot easier. And finally, I would like to say uh, this as well. I was also reading um, something very important. Uh, I, I read this one, the Economic Intelligence Unit Index on, on Inclusion uh, 2020 report. I estimated that there are over 800 million Africans um, that lack access to, 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 to the internet. And as a result, now you have the likes of Facebook investing so much in infrastructure connectivity in Africa so that they will be um, there first. I actually wanted to mention specifically that I'm working with uh, some Nigerian um, youth who have actually developed uh, a system when they understood the opportunity in Nigeria that there were so many um, small and medium enterprises that do not have internet presence. And they put together a collection of um, tools that would make them to have uh, presence, web presence immediately, you know, within few, uh, I think in a matter of days, you know, instead of them investing in developing website and giving them the visibility. And these are really game changing things. And the company is called the USAC and I'm still working with them. I link them up with some investors here in the UK and they're working. So the opportunities in Africa are absolutely mind blown. Absolutely, really, it's, it's a gold mine. And I see that in the future, um, I think there's a lot that is gonna be happening uh, in Africa. And now that we realize, for example, with the COVID-19 that it's neither, them, us, or something like that. It is us all together, you know. So if something is happening in Africa, then it's going to continue to happen. And also uh, to the world globally. And very importantly for the entrepreneurs, it's not just a matter of them investing because it is in Africa and they have the social kind of peer. No, no, no. But in terms of making the profit itself, it is a lot 
better and easier and faster to scale your business if you invest in a socially driven business, for example, because the problems are there. Africa is no short of problems. You apply it. You don't have to look for more customers, for example. So this is just a summary of, of yeah, the answer. No, <laughs> absolutely. And, and I did a webinar, I think maybe a week ago or, or 10 days ago with uh, Dr. Matama uh, about family business. Um, and um, and yes. um, so, and we talk about the concept of family and how mm. everything is integrated together. And also mm. on Saturday, we did it with a conference with our colleagues from Italy and Korea about yeah. the concept of humane entrepreneurship, mm. okay? Hmm. The, the intersection of humane entrepreneurship, uh, yeah. digital, and uh, family, uh, there, there are a lot of intersections. You can hmm. go back and forth here. But, and I know we're, we're limited on time here. We have this. But how do you see, and I'm going to put you on the spot here, how, how do you see the role of humane entrepreneurship tied to digi digitization, tied, I know you mentioned the SDGs, but this yeah. whole underlined with the concept of family, of oneness. Mm. What's your reaction to this? Uh, you know, I, last week I, you know, attended the the the, uh, the, the humane entrepreneurship the conference you had. Yeah, the humane entrepreneurship. I was really fascinated by all the papers presented. So the the, the way I see, there are a lot of uh, overlaps. And these are all mutually reinforcing. If you notice, like in the last slides I presented, I said, um, I call it the cycle of good. And, you know, goodness, you know, application of technology for social good. Um, for example, there is the, the summit that um, it takes place every year, which is um, Artificial Intelligence, um, World Summit for Artificial Intelligence for, so for Social Good, for example. Th these are emerging concepts, and I think humane entrepreneurship is really, really behind all of this because it is about providing this humane or human orientation to things. You know, it does not have to be intelligence, for example, can be slow. It doesn't have to be fast. Um, capital that fuels entrepreneurial growth can be patient. It doesn't have to be impatient, you know, and all that is pointing to humane entrepreneurship because you are putting together, you, you are putting the, the, the human you know, at the center of it. One of the presenters in the event presented a company where the company grown and I think possibly the, in, in cycle and then the cycle representing the employees perhaps maybe either remain the same or something like that. You know, a humane, uh, the argument is that a humane company, you know, wh when the cycle grows, <laughs> then the, 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 the employees should also grow depending on what uh, so I, I see the human entrepreneurship playing a huge, great role. And I think there is a lot of overlaps with some of the things that I also, um, you know, discussed today uh, about, you know, digital futures, the, the slow entrepreneurship, slow movement. Because if you think about it, who is behind, who is the entrepreneur behind all that fast moving uh, companies that, you know, are destroying the environment? Who trained them? Who put high expectation on them. It is all us in the society, either educating them to be that or putting the expectation on how they should or must behave. Yeah, um, absolutely. Excellent presentation, as Mansoor mentioned here. We, we have two minutes left here. Um, okay. Well, so my question, my last question to you is a two-part question here, right? Yeah. What are you working on now that's of interest to you? And, um, and, and number two, here, which is that, what's your final kind of words that you want to share with us as we end the session? Okay, um, so the, the first question is what I'm working on. I'm actually working on a lot of things now, um, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm, I'm working on open innovation as well, uh, because I know that, you know, this is something quite very crucial going forward, you know, because we have to work together to solve uh, world global problems and as you can see digital entrepreneurship and also uh, the slow entrepreneurship peripheral entrepreneurship these are something um, that i'm beginning to to invest my time and research more on because most of the things that you see it's not about slowness of of it if you're slow then it means you're less uh, intelligent uh, presumably but that isn't the case so i would like to make a case for that going forward yeah, and what was the second question again? I mean, your last remarks, kind of like your last thoughts as, as, as we end this session. Okay, as we end the session, and, and I, I say to you, um, like we, we go back to the intelligence definition of the rural Kenyans. Uh, it may be rural Kenyans, but 
I like the issues of respect. You know, be an entrepreneur, be a digital entrepreneur, but you must respect other humans. Uh, be a digital entrepreneur, but you must respect the environment. Apply the technology, um, but you know, for social good, uh, artificial intelligence for social good. This is my word. But my final word also is that the world, the world counts on you. It's not an individual. It's a collective effort. So please, if you have a solution that you think is going to help the world be a better place, please go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been an excellent, excellent, absolutely superb webinar here. This is just the start. We're, we're just starting. Uh, I knew yeah. this would be great. I knew we we're going we we're gonna to be covering a lot of things, and there's a lot of things to cover here. So we will... Um, we, we, will, we will come back together again. This is just, again, this is just the beginning. This is our first step here. I want to thank you on behalf of all of ICSB, ICSB yeah. board and ICSB members worldwide. I think we are all, um, Sylvia and everybody's congratulating you on an exceptional webinar. We are going to post this online and we're going to share okay. it with our members worldwide here. And you're coming back. Trust me. I have more, okay. I have more circles. <laughs> I have more circles on my okay. <laughs> So, All um, right, I'm, I'm very ready for that. <laughs> I look forward to that, I'm an, I enjoyed this. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. And I want for all of you, thank you again for attending. Uh, we look forward to another ICSP Exchange webinar. Please stay safe, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye, everybody.